Hello, everyone. This is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. So our guest today is the medical director of uh, the PADA Institute, Center for Interventional Pain Management in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. He's received his medical degree from the University of uh, Missouri, Kansas City in surgery, anesthesia, and pain medicine. He's also certified in cosmetic procedures like abdominoplasty, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and liposuction. He also holds an MBA and several other qualifications. So he, his interests are uh, uh, pretty diverse. Dr. Gurpreet Pada, welcome to Low Carbon Fasting. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Dr. Pada, um, did, did, are you the founder of the Pada Institute? Yeah, I am. Uh, and at first, I didn't want to name it that. Uh, but we do so many different things. So I had to come up with something that combined a bunch of different areas of specialty under one common roof, because um, what we do uh, does not fit nicely into a specific specialty. Um, I started off my world in um, surgery at Cook County in Chicago, which is a major trauma institute. And um, I loved what I was doing, but sometimes I would get bored. Um, and so I liked pharma pharmacology. So I went into anesthesia next. Um, and that was fascinating. And for about 10 or 12 years, I did pediatric heart, liver, lung transplant uh, as a pediatric anesthesiologist. Um, and eventually I wanted to help more people. So I tried to figure out if there was some place that I could apply my surgical skills, my pharmaceutical skills, and my ability to do fine fine, fine procedures, uh, fine, fine point procedures. And so I went into anesthesia, interventional pain. Uh, and then from there, uh, realizing that we had a, a serious problem with obesity in the US and that it was related to pain, I got certified in managing patients with addiction and obesity as well. Uh, and so we have a, a bunch of different things and we warehouse them all in under one common entity. And it, it, to do it over again, I would probably call it the Center for Metabolic Inflammation mm -hmm. uh, because that's what all of the pathologies that I'm dealing with is metabolic inflammation. That's the common nexus. So long story short, yeah, it's the PADA Institute, but it's really, I couldn't figure out a way to, initially to put it all together until much later. That I think leads me to my next question because um, in your website, you focus hugely on reversal. And you, in fact, you take pride in uh, in the uh, in your institute's uh, sort of drive to reverse or put into remission type two diabetes. And then you also help people with various pains. And I was just going to ask you what what the link between those two conditions is if at all there is a link. Yeah, so it, it's really, it's it's chronic disease. Um, that's the gener generic term, which is $1.7 trillion in US healthcare expenditures. About two thirds of healthcare expenditure in the United States is related to um, metabolic inflammation. Mm -hmm. And it's associated with type two diabetes and obesity. Um, and what we spend our time doing is getting that reversed. The reason why we're effective at it, because your regular chances of losing weight or, or even getting somewhat healthy um, is about less than 1%, one chance in 167 to one chance in 230 or 214. In our institute, we're running about an 80% effectiveness, eight out of 10. Um, the reality is, is that I'm in a different situation than most people because people come to me not because they think they're overweight. They don't come to me saying, hey, I think I have metabolic inflammation. They come to me initially because they have severe unrelenting pain or they have an addiction or they have a PTSD or they have some other clinical manifestation that really bothers them. And it's, it's the equivalent of kind of taking the, the thorn out of a, a lion's paw. 
Um, if you saw my presentation, one of the first slides that I showed was a picture of Androsceles. It's it's the Greek slave Androsceles who plucks the thorn from a lion's paw, and forever that li that lion is his friend. Um, and so for me, I'm able to convince patients, hey, look, you have this chronic pain, you have this addiction, you have this other disease process, but underlying this, there's there's what there's a reason why you have it, and here it is. And then using that, I'm able to change their paradigm and get them to understand true metabolism and start to reverse that. So my average patient comes in and they're on 90 to 140 milligram morphine equivalent. My average patient comes in and they're on an average 200 pounds overweight. My average patient comes in and I'm by average, I mean 99%. <laughs> um, and so almost all of them are uniformly ill and they almost all have more than three disease processes and they almost all have processed food addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're able to unwrap those issues and unwind a lot of those and get them to, to feeling better, better and get them to wean off their pain medications, fix their underlying anxiety, depression disorders and start working on their weight. Um, and it's not that we're doing something magical, but we're able to focus in on the paradigm that's causing their problem and, and really assist them in that. Um, and so that, that that's how we kind of are all together in that kind of issue. That That's why it, it for me, it's very synergistic. It, it's more of a holistic approach rather than just fixing their pain or just fixing their diabetes. And I have an advantage because the patients that I have are in pain. They're not just regular patients. They have chronic pain. They have polyjoint arthralgias. So what are some of the pains? If, uh, can we go, uh, uh, can, can you give some examples? What are some of the pains that people come to you with? Um, oh. I think migraines is one. Yeah, we certainly deal with a ton of migraines, but the most common pain that people come, and it's two thirds of all US patients and probably two thirds of British patients as well. The, the most common pain is low back pain low back pain and neck pain that prevents functionality. Um, and that's the most common. And they usually have tried non-steroidals. They've tried paracetamol or they've tried uh, Tylenol or they've tried medications. A lot of them have been put on other stronger medications. Majority of them have been tried on opiates um, and they didn't work out. A lot of them have been to physiotherapy or physical therapy. Um, almost all of them have. And the average patient's been had symptoms for years. And it gets to the point where they, it affects their day-to-day -day activities. And it ends up at the point where they end up with sleep deprivation. And once you get into this doom loop of disturbing your sleep, lacking restorative sleep, uh, once you get into the endocrine effects of lack of sleep, where you lose your testosterone, um, you start to get cognitive impairment, your job function starts to go down. Um, you start to have more difficulties in your family. Statistically, patients with one member who has chronic pain, the whole family unit drops by, by at least one standard deviation to the norm on financial household income for the entire family unit. And so there's a higher divorce rate, higher um, job loss rate, higher economic deprivation rate. People go from owning a home to ending up renting a home. They go from renting a home to end up being homeless or having to co-share. And so there's an economic impact that's sequential. Um, and so that, that's the medical end of my life is dealing with that. But if in that you catch a little whiff of economics because I have a background in finance and I've always been fascinated by how financial systems work. So I went off and got an MBA in finance and I ended up wanting to analyze cross-border issues. So I ended up getting a degree in international finance. It gave me the um, understanding of, of metrics and it gave me the understanding of creating financial model, models, but I wanted to see compared to what, you know, just because it's in the US or just because it's in a Westernized country, how does it compare to a non-Westernized country? And how does it compare to other areas? And so I always have this um, approach where I, compare what's going on here in the U.S. to what goes on in China or what goes on in India or what goes on in South Korea. So I'm always curious about what, what those other issues are. I do have a question about uh, the social and economic sides, but uh, as I was coming back to metabolic um, <laughs> health, 
So where does inflammation fit into all this? So in, uh, with respect to diabetes, well, I were talking about type two. So uh, my, my audience knows I'm type one diabetes. That's a whole different sort of beast. But so we're talking about type two diabetes here and, and also all these chronic pains, lower back pain, migraines, um, or general probably joint pains, right? Uh, so where does inflammation fit into this picture? So there's a couple of pathways. Um, and this is even valid for type 1 diabetics eventually. And because most type 1 diabetics are treated with insulin. And insulin is a pathog pathologic instrument if used in the wrong way. If I take a healthy person and I make them a type 1 diabetic, they become very thin. And they, they lose almost all of their weight very quickly. Because insulin doesn't work in the way that we think. Insulin historically has been thought, oh, you know, insulin allows glucose to get into the cell. That's only partly true. Insulin actually has two other factors. Insulin allows glucose to get into the cell so that it evacuates an excessive amount of glucose from the bloodstream because excess of glucose creates an oxidation reaction and causes rusting of cellular material. But the second thing insulin does is it also is a growth factor. It's a potent growth factor. Now, back to the first thing, insulin allows glucose to enter the cell and it shunts the glucose into first glycogen reserve. And once the glycogen reserves are topped off, the rest of it is stored as fat. And we have an unlimited storage of fat. We only can store about 2000 kilocalories of glycogen in our liver bed and this various other areas, but we have nearly unlimited fat storage. And the problem is, is that we have a hormone called leptin. And when we eat food, the fat releases leptin. And that tells our brain, our hypothalamus, that, hey, we're full, stop eating, you know, stop, stop eating this food. The problem is that the more fat that we have, the more leptin we release, and we become leptin resistant. So our brain no longer recognizes that we're full. So that would be okay, except that leptin is also one of the strongest, most potent inflammatory cytokines that we have. And hyperleptinemia causes severe inflammation. And it's the leptin from your visceral fat that causes systemic metabolic inflammation. Now, at the same time, you've got this issue where you exposed your mitochondria to too much glucose because you were hyperinsulinemic. And that gums up the mitochondria and the mitochondrial inner, inner shell starts to become dysfunctional and your active oxidase systems fail. And so eventually you become insulin resistant because you've got too much insulin. That's why when I take a type one diabetic and give them a bunch of insulin, the first thing that happens is one, they restore their, they're not type, you know, they're, they're still type one diabetic, but they start to thrive. And then they start to overthrive because they start to get fat. They, they store too much viscerogenic fat. Well, a type two diabetic starts there. They're eating too much food and they have hyperinsulinemia. And eventually they have a problem in that they have systemic metabolic inflammation. They continue to gain the weight and eventually they gain so much weight that it decreases the perfusion of what's going into their pancreas. And there's a paracrine effect from glucagon to insulin in the from beta cell to alpha cell in the pancreas, and they stop producing insulin. And so that's when you transition into adult onset or LADA or type two diabetes that becomes totally insulin dependent uh, when, they, when they stop producing any insulin at all. And then there's a secondary effect that the local mic macrophages start to activate and they cause issues. Now, I'm gonna give you another part of this puzzle. And that is that fat, actually, if you go back teleologically, if you go back and say, hey, what, what is fat? What was primitive fat? What was its intent? Well, one, it was there to store energy for a time period when you had to go from place to place and you need to store energy and you couldn't carry it with you. So you carried it in you. You weren't going to put a bison on your back, but you could store up 30 pounds of extra fat and they would carry you for, you know, 150, 250, 300 miles, 500 miles, and you could starve for the next 500 miles and be okay as long as you got some water. 
the the long part of it is teleologically that fat that we have in in our viscera starts off back in the dorsophila back in the fruit fly and it's a three component system it's that it's called a, a, a fat body the fat body contains with it the fat an immune system and a liver function system the immune system is where most of our macrophages come from and so we have these macrophages that are first alarm systems that are associated with our fat and they also light up as our fat gets thicker and we get these cytokines kicking in the cytokines cause the activation of the nascent uh, mito, uh the nascent macrophages so it, it, it's a complicated mess but it's interrelated once you understand that the fat is not just fat the fat is an organ and the organ used to be immune organ fat organ and liver organ um then you realize where we are now as humans that don't need to carry 30 or 40 pounds of extra fat around to go from one hunting area to another and so now when we um carry this extra fat we never get rid of it and now when we have activation of our fat um we have terrible immune responses with systemic inflammation that that's how i ended up here are we specifically talking about fat in the viscera or uh all fat all like fat but fat. predominantly visceral it's all fat but predominantly visceral fat that's why visceral fat is so much more dangerous than regular fat um regular fat intercalated into muscle causes a different problem but the the visceral fat is hyper immune and also realize that the visceral fat is right next to your intestines and it's an early response system so if you eat something that you're not supposed to eat it's going to be attacked by the local macrophages which are associated with the viscera and it's going to send an alarm system the innate immune system is going to activate immediately and it's going to send alarm systems all over your body i just ate something i wasn't supposed to and i'm being attacked by some sort of bacteria or some sort of virus and so that's the early alarm system for your body it's intended to be there um now the fat in your in your skeletal muscle is a little bit different and that's a different storage mechanism and those lipid droplets cause a different problem and I'll actually be talking about that in a few weeks at um at the next low carb conference in in Boca Denver? which specifically oh, yeah which specifically is what is the fat doing um in our muscles and how does that affect us and how is it preparing us for the metaverse how is how is that intercalated fat affecting our capacity to function as human beings and what it's doing is it's causing our regular muscle once you intercalate it with fat um to become fast twitch fiber and it also causes it to lose integrity and strength so the fiber starts to look plumper but it doesn't have any strength and so that's it, it so you lose about 30% of your you get 30% sarcopenic wasting by intercalating the fat into your into your muscle hmm. can you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, fast twitch uh fiber yeah so normally if you uh, are lifting weight and you're you're having to do a squat to pick a bison off the ground or if you're having to sling something over your shoulder and carry it or you have to pull yourself up off of a cliff mm -hmm. um you don't use fast twitch you use regular regular muscle fibers fast twitch is rapid action very small movement so fast twitch would be i'm playing on a video game those are fast twitches when i'm playing on a, an xbox um regular fiber would be me lifting something um fast twitch is very very rapid movement um very very tiny movements um regular twitch fibers or or the bigger gross motor movements that we normally think of as exercise mm -hmm. okay so now we mentioned exercise um people who come to you what's what's the first i mean uh, oh, you probably do recommend some kind of exercise but if someone is in pain like lower back pain which i've had in the past 
and it's not an easy thing to deal with on top of frozen diabetic frozen shoulders. So uh, fortunately, I'm so much better now, but uh, because um, <laughs> because of the low carbohydrate or the ketogenic lifestyle. But um, but my question is, uh, it, how much exercise can you recommend to 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 your patients when they're suffering um, uh, pain? So the first thing to do is get them out of the pain. Um, and so we use a combination of injections, medication management, coaching, and dietary change to get them out of the pain initially. Um, and then we start off with simple things like just mobility, start to move their joints. We don't really get to exercise till we're farther along. So if I take somebody and they are 100 pounds overweight and they have low back pain and I put them into an exercise program per 10 pounds overweight, that's 240 axial loading pounds. So if you're hundred pounds overweight, you have 2,400 pounds of axial loading. And so if I make you jump around and throw that around, it's gonna throw your back out more. And usually the problem is, is that you've lost your core strength. You've lost the opposing muscles that are maintaining the integrity in your strength. So I have to fix that first before I start putting you into a massive exercise program. And we all know that exercise, you can't outrun a bad diet, no matter what you do. If you have a, a terrible diet, you're not gonna bring your weight down. So the first thing is just to bring your weight down. And so we have steps that we go through. And we, we you know, when we first start out, the first thing to do is get their inflammation to, to settle down. Um, and so I look, I've looked at the elements that are easy for my patients to manage and, and, and to deal with. Our earliest step is one, to get them off their vegetable oil. Um, we get them away from their omega-6s and we start supplementing with omega-3s. That's step one. Step two is to get them away from processed refined carbohydrate and get them to real food. Um, and as we do that, then we, we go through sleep counseling, we go through other activities and simple things, just like simply depleting their daily glycogen reserve. The thing is that if you don't deplete your glycogen and, and so the, the system is you consume food, you'll store two to 3000 kilocalories of glycogen. And most people, um, once they deplete that glycogen out of their liver, will start to burn the fat. Mm. But the problem is in the U.S., most people constantly eat all the time. They eat from sunup to sundown and well after sundown. And so they never deplete their glycogen. So they're stacking fat on top of glycogen and they never burn through the initial glycogen. You have a limited glycogen store, but you have unlimited fat. And until you deplete your glycogen first, you can't burn your fat. So what I try to do is get them to change their dietary intake and do restrict, time-restricted nutrition to start beating their glycogen reserves down. And then that will put them into ketosis. But you don't go into ketosis until you get rid of your glycogen reserve. And that's what it takes about three days for most people. And so that, that's the critical element. Once you're, and, and so realize also ketosis is a measure of how is your insulin? Because if you're producing insulin, you cannot, you, you won't go into ketosis uh, until, you, until you reduce your insulin production. And so those, those are the kind of metrics that we look at. So first thing is vegetable oil, because we want to change the fluidity of their membranes. And you, you'll see an effect at about 12 to 18 weeks. We want to change their carbohydrate intake. You'll see, you can see that effect in three to five days. Um, you can see their glycogen reserves coming down. You can get them into ketosis. Ketosis itself is, allows you pain relief. Um, and at the same time, uh, and if you get into sufficient ketosis, there's certain pathologies that are epileptogenic, uh, that are seizure-oriented, such as migraine headaches. It can eliminate those. So there's all kinds of little nuances to that. Depending on the kind of person it is, we may be putting them into an infrared sauna. We may be putting them into a heated sauna. Um, we try to do all of the things that we can to improve their metabolism and increase their joint uh, their joint health and the amount of fluid fluid around their joint, the, the healthy fluid. Um, and then we get them into exercise later. The simple exercise is just walking. And I encourage patients to walk after every meal as best as they can. Uh, if they're watching TV, they're, they're to constantly be in motion. I don't, I want to get rid of their sedentary activity. 
Right now, the average American spends nine hours a day in sedentary activity that's outside of sleep. Um, and some patients, that's average. Some patients are spending 17 hours in sedentary activity. Those happen to be my patients. Um, so we try to fix that. And then we also fix gut microbiome. Uh, we go through there and, and try to deal with their anxiety and fix their gut microbiome. We go through there and give them sleep hygiene, uh, dark, cold room with a fan um, and no blue light for two to four hours before bed, no caffeine for uh, six hours before bed. Um, and we, we kind of have a protocol that we march through sequentially. Dr. Pada, you mentioned the uh, seed oils or vegetable oils. Um, can we talk about them a little bit, bit more, please? Sure. What way do they cause inflammation or do they make already existing inflammation worse? They actually cause inflammation. Okay. And here's why. Um, they're industrial seed oils. They're, industrial seed oils are a hyper-processed, refined oil um, that has a couple of unusual interactions. Um, the thing is, what they do, they're called omega-6s. Um, they stack beautifully. When, when you put them side by side by side by side, they cause a stacking effect to occur in the cell membrane. So it makes the cell membrane more rigid. And as you lose the fluidity of the cell membrane, it affects the receptors that are on the surface cell wall. And so it makes the receptors less active. Um, and so independently of anything else, these the, the loss of fluidity dramatically decreases the effect of receptors on the cell walls. Uh, additionally, all, all, of them, all of them. Yeah, because you change the fluidity. The receptors have to open and close within a fluid mosaic, a uh, fluid bilayer mosaic. Mm -hmm. And if the fluid bilayer mosaic is more brick-like, you can't open and close the receptors as well. So that's issue one. Issue two is that the 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 precursor for arachidonic acid is a, is some of this omega six fat omega six fatty acids, and so though that's the pass, pathway for prostaglandins, which is hyperinflammatory. Um, and then the other problem is that much of the, the the bigger problem probably is that much of the omega six you can't tell when it's rancid. See the thing is that omega three when it's rancid. It smells like dead fish and you won't eat it. Omega-6 when it's rancid doesn't have a flavor and it becomes rancid with fluorescent lighting, with time, with a little bit of temperature. And so you'll end up eating rancid omega-6 omega and not realize it. And that is a polyunsaturated fatty acid with multiple cross linkages. And those multiple cross linkages affect lipid bilayers they also cause fusing of the of the cell wall and they trigger um they trigger an inflammatory response and so it causes again systemic inflammation and it probably is we know for fact that um there's a strong association between vegetable oil aerosolized so if i take vegetable oil and i aerosolized it mm -hmm. we know that that is strongly associated with lung cancer We've shown studies out of China where women in China who are non-smokers have a higher lung cancer rate than smokers in anywhere else in the world. That's because they're getting inhaled polyunsaturated fatty acid, which is rancid, and it's inhaled into their lungs, and that's how they're getting their cancer. Um, and so we know it's a hyperinflammatory medium. Is it also, so omega-6s, are they also obesogenic? They are through the through the course of the creation of insulin resistance and through the course of uh, making your receptors non-functional. But independently, there's also a breakdown product that is it's a breakdown product that is akin to anandamide um, and it breaks down into a um, into a compound that kind of gives you like the munchies that you would have if you were using marijuana. There's a there's a compound very similar to that that's a breakdown product of omega-6. Fascinating. 
<laughs> we're going to talk about um, fructose and glucose now and uh, their link with um, inflammation. Mm -hmm. So the, there are direct links. I mean, certainly there's direct links to the liver. Um, so consider for a second what sugar is. Sugar is a disaccharide. What that means is it is two elements. So table sugar is a glucose and fructose combined. Glucose is um, is the is the sugar that gets into your bloodstream, and there are insulin receptors that allow the glucose to enter the cell. Fructose is independent of that, but fructose is very interesting. When you consume fructose, it first goes straight to the liver and is stored as fat predominantly without insulin. So it's early storage into non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's, it causes NAFLD. Um, so it gets an early storage in the liver. Fructose has a second side effect though that most people don't recognize, but the, but the agricultural companies do recognize it. Um, fructose activates the dopaminergic system which is our uh, addiction system. And glucose does not. Glucose activates the serotonergic system, which is our feel-good system, but not necessarily dopamine. Serotonin gives you a sense of tranquility. Dopamine gives you a sense of high. And the thing is that high fructose corn syrup, which is what's in our sugar-sweetened beverages, is purposely built so that we constantly go back and have another soda, go back and have another soda, go back and have another soda. And they, they concentrate the fructose to such a level that um, it's, they spend a lot of extra money to dramatically increase the amount of fructose in, in, in food to make it more palatable and more um, addictive. Mm -hmm. So those are the two elements that I usually worry about is, is that one, you're getting more non-alcoholic fatty liver and two, fructose is much more, um, it makes food much more palatable and more addictive. But with, uh, when it comes to diabetes reversal, uh, do you tell your diabetic patients uh, it's best to avoid both? Yeah, we want them to avoid all sweeteners. <laughs> As a type one. As a type one, I know that, I mean, a piece of fruit can just, shut my blood levels up so you know all that uh, nonsense i followed for years of oh eat lots of fruit and veg as if fruit and veg are just in the same category and they're so dissimilar in many ways because spinach or i don't know cucumbers are very different from uh, mangoes and uh, <laughs> and pineapples but i treated them the same because as long as i was having my five a day or five pieces of fruit a day um, i was fine and my blood sugars were awful i could there is no way i could control them there's just no way i could control them so. yeah it's called marketing um because they purposely have marketed you into believing that fruit and vegetables are healthy and they put them together but if they said to you instead dessert and vegetables you would think again dessert's not a vegetable <laughs> and that's what fruit is fruit is a dessert it's it's a hyper palatable dessert and right now we've manipulated our food supply so much so that if you took a, a glass of grapes, you took a, a glass and you put grapes in it and you smashed it down, it would have more sugar than the same volume of soda because we re-engineered our grapes to have so much more sugar in them. Mm -hmm. uh, and same thing with almost all of our, all of our food supply, we've re-engineered it. So to make it more palatable for our tongues that are now used to much more sugar. So they're sweeter much sweeter that's why the uh, blackberries for example that grow naturally here in the uk and they're very seasonal they've got a short period growing season of uh, i don't know two or three weeks and if you just pick them off the bush um, they don't taste anything like the blackberries that you would buy all year round in the supermarkets which are much larger um and and sweeter so <laughs> and it took you a lot more effort to pick up the berries from the bush. So you expended a lot of energy and it hurt because you probably got pinched by needles, mm -hmm. um, by, by the thorns. And so there's a beautiful picture of the, um, the folks harvesting bee, bee honey 
in the mountains, I think in uh, in South Asia. And it's these bee keep these bee harvesting honey, these honey harvesting folks. And they have to climb two, three hundred feet up into the air to get up into the to get some honey from these bees. It's a tremendous energy expenditure to do that. So there's always a balance between how much energy did you use to get the resource and how much energy did the resource produce? And we flipped that over. So now it takes us almost no energy to get the thing that we want. And the, ener and the thing that we want has a tremendously high, high amount of energy so that we have an energy imbalance. It doesn't take us hardly any money or effort to get a nutrient, a lack of nutrient dense carbohydrate. Um, and so we have this energy imbalance. We, we can go get right from our cupboards. We can go get a, a ton of sugar and it took us 30 seconds. Um, whereas before you would have to work all season to get that much sugar to store for the winter when you really needed it. And that was a, that's why sugar was such a valuable resource. Now it's everywhere just because we're hedonically driven. We're dopaminergic driven. And so we look for those sugar hits. Yes, the same can be said of uh, similar to honey uh, as, uh, uh, about um, um, nut butters, for example. I mean, you can eat a full jar because it's just easier. However, if you're picking the nuts and going th through the trouble of shelling them and, uh, <laughs> and uh, turning them into nut butters, that energy put into it would um, you it wouldn't even yield like jar after jar. Now, I think another problem that we have currently is that there's just no limit to how much we can consume. It's right. jar after jar of honey, which may not even be natural honey, which it often is not actually. <laughs> uh, same for peanut butters or, um, you know, all these uh, other uh, palatable foods. They're not yeah, just everywhere, but they're like in the, uh, unlimited amounts. They made it too convenient. And, and we've done that on purpose. Uh, the more palatable it is, the more we want to eat it. The more convenient it is, the more of it we're going to eat. And we're getting to the point now where um, it, it's, it used to be that religion was the opiate of the masses. And now I think it's not religion anymore because we've fallen away from religion. And now I think it's food is the opiate of the masses. Um, because it actually creates an opiate release that's or a dopaminergic response that's pretty evident. And so my approach to patients is to get them to understand that food is hyper addictive and to, and that's also how I'm managing their pain. And that's why I'm forwarded an addiction. So it's food is addictive. And once you understand that, you can then start to um, modify your behavior with food and, and get that to, to work better. Next question is, I mean, what foods do you find from experience that most of your patients um, are addicted to? It probably varies from person to person and uh, processed foods, fructose, but are there any other types of food that you find some of your patients are addicted to? Well, I mean, they're all addicted to the things that are advertised. This is all driven by advertising. Um, and so it's, we're being manipulated into eating things that we have no business eating. Um, in the United States, the, the large uh, cereal manufacturers pay large amounts of money to the medical associations to give them symbology that they can put on their food that says it's heart healthy. And so that symbology then confuses the consumer into thinking, well, I can eat all of this. So I'll give you a classic example. I had a patient who's an immigrant to the United States. They're from Bosnia. And she could not for the life of her understand why she had come to the United States. She was very thin. And within two years, she was morbidly obese. And she was doing everything she could to get the weight off, but she couldn't do it. There was no way. And everything that she tried, the weight kept getting worse. And so finally, we had her keep a, a food diary and it didn't tell me much. So I sat down with her. I said, look, you kept this food diary. It looks pretty good. Um, it looks like you're eating whole food and none of it has a ton of sugar in it. Let's go through your day. And we went through her day and it quickly became evident that she was eating about three, three bowls of cereal a day 
that she wasn't putting in her food diary because it was heart healthy. It was it was the Cheerios that she was eating with milk, and she thought that milk was giving her um, vitamin D, and the, and the and she thought that the Cheerios were heart healthy. So that she didn't consider something that she had to write down. She wrote down all the other stuff that she was doing, but she didn't put that down because that had been marketed to her as some sort of ethereal thing that was beyond food. It was heart healthy. That's not something that you would think that you would have to worry about. Uh, and in fact, that was the thing that was getting her. And so as soon as we got her off of her cereal, she promptly started losing a ton of weight. And it took us about a year uh, and we got her back to near ideal body weight. I mean, she, she, she was relatively short. She's about five foot two. And when she came into me, she weighed well over 250 pounds. And we got her down to about 125, 130, and it took us about a year. Um, and it was simply from the cereal that, and sugar uh, and milk that she was consuming that she thought was good for her. So it's every person, um, it depends on their media consumption. The more the different types of media that they've consumed or been exposed to really informs them on what they should eat, what they think they should eat. I also find though that if they go to a dietitian. Uh, in the United States, a lot of them are trained by um, by big 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 agra. Um, that's the largest funders of nutritional programs. And so sometimes some of them misinterpret that uh, processed food is healthy. I mean, just because it has zero or low carbohydrate doesn't mean it's healthy if it's a processed refined food. Um, there's all kinds of other compounds in processed refined food. That has serious impact on glycemic index, has serious impact on gut health, has serious impact on absorption. And the other thing is that just because something says it has 20 grams of a protein, um, the way that we measure protein is by nitrogen. Well, I can make anything have 20 grams of protein. Sawdust can have 20 grams of, of nitrogen if I add some urea to it, but it's not real, it's not real protein. Uh, and so you have to keep in mind that. Sometimes people tell you they're eating healthy things and it would look like they are, but they're not. And then they completely ignore gut health. People think that peanuts are healthy. So they think peanut butter is healthy, but they don't realize there's sugar added. And they may not realize that frequently peanuts are grown in soil that the previous year was grown with cotton. And they spray the cotton with insecticide and herbicide, but they don't spray the peanuts. But the peanuts are soil-based and it picks up the herbicide pesticide from the soil, from the cotton from the previous year. And when you cycle that a few times, cotton, peanut, cotton, peanut, cotton, peanut, by the fifth or sixth generation of peanut, you have a hyper-concentrated pesticide enriched peanut. Um, and so those are the kind of things that you have to delve into. Each patient's a little bit different. Each patient's a bit of a puzzle uh, and putting it into the context of their, their gut health is really important. And um, but like you said, the, the, the most common thing is they're just eating too much sugar. They're just eating way too much sugar and, um, they're typically not realizing it. Uh, it, it's hidden sugar because they wouldn't go out and sit, sit in front of a bowl of sugar and take a tablespoon of it and put it in their mouth. That doesn't seem very palatable, but if you use a little bit of seduction and you put it into fruit or you put it into something else, or you put it into something that's apparently healthy. You can get people to eat all kinds of things. Whole wheat, whole wheat flour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and you shouldn't be eating any flour. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it, it, I would tell you that the vast majority of patients, um, they don't have you know, celiac sprue, but the vast majority of human beings um, have zonulin defects when they're exposed to flour, when they're exposed to the, the gluten and gliadin in flour. And so the vast majority of people will have some response. Some people are relatively resistant to that response, but some people are not. In the US, about a third to half the people have some degree of significant daily anxiety. Well, how much of that is related to their dietary intake? How much of that is affecting their heart rate variability? How much of that is causing a major portion of the de depression? Uh, Dr. Chris Palmer just recently came up with a book on this. And you know, I, I met Chris, he's, he's, he's an awesome, writer and he he's in this field of, of psychiatric diet dietetics and you know th there's a lot of stuff that that's in that it's it's there's nothing new in there but he's brought it together so beautifully and so elegantly that maybe people will be able to consume it in a in a more informed way mm -hmm. 
So, so your dietary recommendations from what you've described uh, are sort of lower, lower carbohydrate um, diet, as well as <laughs> intermittent fasting or time restricted eating, whichever way uh, you want to, to, to describe it. So our channel is called low carbon fasting. So, <laughs> so you're all for fasting and the benefits of fasting or time restricted eating. And so, so was I right though, when I said that, so your recommendation is mainly low carbohydrate diet? Yeah, I, my recommendation is no carbohydrate, uh, no refined carbohydrates at all. Um, and if you get a carbohydrate, it should be an incidental carbohydrate that might be a few grams. Um, but the goal is not to consume carbohydrates for the purpose of carbohydrate consumption. Recognize that carbohydrate consumption is a dessert. And so there will be times that you want to have dessert and you need occasionally to have a dessert because you're in a social environment that you're having this performance enhancing drug, because that's what carbohydrates are. They're used for performance enhancement or for joyous celebrations where you want to release dopamine. And that's what they're for. But there's no necessity for you to, ex to consume a carbohydrate at all. You, there's no intrinsic essential carbohydrates that we have to have. There are essential fatty acids and there are essential amino acids, proteins and fats, but there's no essential carbohydrates. So technically, and I have, pa I have patients that don't consume external carbohydrates at all. Then they go for years without consuming carbohydrates. Um, and they don't have a problem with scurvy. They don't have a problem with some of these other things. So, and they don't have to take supplementation. You know, it's, so it's it's not, I, I strongly urge patients, especially for the first 12 or 14 weeks when they come in to really get off of all carbohydrates, to make a clean break of it. And then if they want to come back and every once in a while, they want to have some fruit, that's fine. If they want to have vegetables that, that have some low dose, low amounts of carbohydrates that are unrefined, that's perfect. Um, but what I'm trying to do is get them initially to clean up their dietary intake so that I can deplete the glycogen, get them kick started into ketosis and get them to start losing fat and then start getting them to move. And then later on, maybe we'll bring some of these things back one item at a time and see what they're sensitive to. Uh, a lot of patients are sensitive to nightshade. Some patients have issues with oxalates. Some patients have issues with phytates. Some patients have issues with, you know, with peanuts. Some patients have issues with cashews. Some patients have issues with the leastins, um, from garlic or from uh, onions. So each person is a little bit different. Um, and that also dictates their gut health. And, and so we, we kind of will go on a pretty strict cleanse for about 12 weeks and then bring back one vegetable matter at a time to see what they're sensitive to. And so when we do a cleanse, what we're really trying to do is get them to um, the initial component. If they can tolerate it, I, I, I want them to eat as much straight protein and fat as possible. So that could be eggs, um, that could be beef, it could be you know any kind of meat. Um, and then some people are vegetarian. And so, you know, then we'll work with them to look at specific lentils and things like that, that they can consume that are extremely high in protein and be very careful of adding anything else. Um, and, you know, we, we encourage them to use butter, real, real oil, uh, rather than vegetable oil, which is industrial seed oil. Um, they can use olive oil. They can use butter. Um, they can use saturated fat from animals. Um, so that's kind of the, the aim that we, that we go towards. Mm -hmm. um, so microbiome, let's talk about the microbiome. Um, you did mention a few um, uh, foods. You left out the artificial sweeteners. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I didn't leave them out on purpose. Uh, we don't encourage anybody to have an artificial sweetener. I know that there's some controversy over that, but it's, I think it's, um, it's inaccurate. Um, there's a very simple issue here. Uh, one, certainly we know that the gut microbiome is affected by artificial sweeteners. Different artificial sweeteners have different effects. And so it can certainly poison um, groups of bacteria that you might wanna maintain. I think the bigger issue though, is the insulin excursion from the anticipatory load that you get. The second that your tongue touches a sweet object, whether it's an artificial sugar or not, your pancreas doesn't know the difference. And if you're a type two diabetic or just a healthy human being, you're gonna start pumping out 
a ton of insulin. And so if, you, if you're a healthy person or a type 2 diabetic that has not stopped producing insulin, you, I give you an artificial sugar, you pump a bunch of insulin, there's no glucose in your bloodstream that's added, and all of a sudden you get hypoglycemic because you had artificial sugar, which then makes you reach around and get some food because now you feel like you're starving and you don't feel well. That's why there's a higher weight gain with people that are eating artificial sugars because they constantly are hungry and foraging for food. Um, so that's issue one. Issue two, though, is that there's a direct effect on the gut microbiome and it kills off populations of bacteria that you might otherwise need. And if you get the wrong population of bacteria, your absorption characteristic goes way high and there's less fermentation that goes on in your gut. And so you absorb more of the um, oligo, oligopolysaccharides and you absorb more of the um, more of the sugars than you normally would. Instead of it being fermented and destroyed in your gut, you get a higher absorption rate. And so you, even for the same dose of sugar, you end up with more sugar in your liver than you would normally get because you've altered your gut microbiome. Okay, so the artificial sweeteners obviously don't have an impact on your uh, blood sugar. So it's, it's kind the of other like secondary effects. The secondary. So uh, when we look at their uh, impact on gut health, um, well, it's disastrous from what you described. Are they worse compared to uh, regular sugar? Probably. Sucrose? Probably. Um, I mean, it depends on the regular sugar you're eating also. But the thing is that these things are, they, the effect of a regular sugar is going to be for the time period that you consume it. So you know what it's going to do. You're going to eat the sugar. Some of it gets fermented. Some of it gets absorbed. And that's the end of it. And it goes into your bloodstream and you release the insulin and it gets stored. In this particular case, though, you eat the artificial sweetener, you get an insulin spike you get hypoglycemic at the same time. And now it's got into your gut and you've changed the gut microbiome. And for a period of time, you've changed the absorption characteristic of everything that came behind. And so now you've screwed up your gut microbiome. And when you do that, you've got anxiety and depression and all the other psychiatric effects and you get into kind of a loop. And so I think that artificial sugars may cause you more difficulty than regular sugars for the same quantity of consumption, for the same episodic consumption. So I encourage my patients not to have artificial sugars. Now, there are some, and they're not all the same. So there are some patients that tolerate, uh, tolerate allulose very well, and they don't have the same effect. Allulose does not seem to have the same effect on the gut microbiome. And it seems to have more of a renal excretion and uh, seems to be a little bit better. So there are some sugars that are artificial that are better than others. Um, I'm not an expert in all of them, but I know that my patients that um, we let them have allulose in, in, in food that they make, they do very well and they don't seem to have the same GI dysfunction uh, as erythritol or saccharin or uh, aspartame and some of the others. Interesting. Um, interesting because I have an anecdote, personal anecdote over uh, the Christmas and the uh, New Year uh, period, and that's the only time in the year when I actually make uh, low carb desserts and I use artificial sweeteners. <laughs> that's the only time in my house you'd find anything that looks like a cake, um, but it's not a regular cake. And I had a terrible, um, uh, a terrible migraine. And I don't, I don't have any migraine. I don't ever remember having migraines. And I thought, okay, so this is what a migraine is, is like. And I, I couldn't understand what it was. Um, I, I don't drink, so it couldn't have been the drinks, uh, the alcohol. So the only thing I'm thinking about was the uh, artificial sweeteners. Um, um, I don't know if there is a link there, but or you're aware of any link, but I had a horrible sort of uh, migraine. And it was like, for the first time in my life, I was just so sympathetic for anyone who suffers regular migraines. It was awful. There I is an interaction between that. To be blamed, yeah. Yeah, there is an interaction and it has to do with your sympathetic and parasympathetic system. And it has to do with gut health. Um, and we have a lot of migraine patients and, um, the underlying effect of migraines is it's really an escape focus of seizure that's occurring inside your brain. Um, and estrogen 
uh, women are more likely to have more escape focuses because it lowers seizure threshold. Um, but men also get them, but it's gut gut health derived. It also is, um, if you have a lot of excess of omega-6, it changes your cellular surface areas and that can cause a problem. But if you get thrown out of ketosis, that'll cause migraines as well. And we use ketosis to stop migraines. We also use ketosis to stop seizure disorders. Um, but one of the things is artificial sugars change your heart rate variability and they affect your sympathetic tone and they make you more sympathetic than parasympathetic. And that sympathetic overload can also trigger migraines. So there's, there's a combination of factors in there. That's fascinating because I actually, uh, I did, I didn't take any medication. I'm not uh, too, too keen on medications, but, uh, but I fasted. <laughs> I fasted for 36 hours and then the migraine was gone and uh, hasn't been back. So, so now you mentioned the ketosis and its, uh, its impact on, uh, you know, uh, on uh, treating uh, the migraines. That's exactly what I did with that, what I did because it just felt natural to me and I am a faster. I do, re do regular fasting, but, uh, but it's uh, incredible you, uh, you mentioned that I didn't realize that it does have such a positive impact on, on migraines. Dr. Pada, I'm aware of time. We're going to wrap this up soon. But can we very quickly talk about um, your perspective on uh, cholesterol? Because if you're putting your, <laughs> at least in the initial period, if you're putting your patients on a zero carbohydrate diet, so zero carbohydrate ba basically means low, uh, no very low vegetables. <laughs> they're eating meat, they're eating they're protein eating and fats. Yeah. What happens to their cholesterol and what happens specifically to the LDL, which is what most, most doctors these days are worried about? So let's, let's step back one step. Um, unless you have fam familial hypercholesterolemia, um, it's really not an issue. That, that's the reality. Now, if you have familial hypercholesterolemia, it's a different story. And certainly we would use medications to address that familial hypercholesterolemia. But the reality is that most patients um, have issues with cholesterol, not because of the cholesterol itself, but because of the inflammatory milieu that, the, that they exist in. Um, the cholesterol you should think of is a Band-Aid. It's, it's the ambulance running to the site of an injury to seal it up. And so just because you have high cholesterol, doesn't mean that you have disease. It just means that you have high cholesterol. There's a lot of patients with very, very high cholesterol that do not have familial hypercholesterolemia that don't have any issue. And in fact, if you look at patients in their 60s, mid 60s, upper 60s, upper 50s even, and you put them on statins, which is cholesterol lowering agents, um, their morbidity mortality may actually go up on cholesterol lowering agents. So you need cholesterol to make hormones. Uh, and without healthy cholesterol, you got a problem. Now the problem, there's, there's one other issue here. It's not all cholesterol that's really bad. See, the thing is that the, what most people measure is LDLC and it's low density lipoprotein C. That's not bad cholesterol. The bad cholesterol is LDLP, it's particle count. It's the small cholesterol. And most people never measure LDLP. Um, we do in our clinic. I have a lot of patients with very high LDLCs, but normal LDLPs. And then I have rare patients that have very high LDLPs, but normal LDLCs. And so it's the LDLP that I'm concerned about. And that's when, that's what I get excited about because that's, that's the patient that I have to worry about. Um, but if you lower their carbohydrates and you've lowered their leptin and their insulin, and you've improved the fluidity of their cell layer, of their, of their bilayer, they're not going to get thrombosis and their inflammatory load goes down and they're going to do better. And so th that's, that's the, the, the gist of the long term. You do see some triglyceride increasing at first, especially if you enter fasting, because your body is lysing fat. And when it lyses fat, it turns it into triglyceride and you get free fatty acids floating around. Um, that's what it's supposed to do. Uh, that's not unhealthy. That's just your food system that you're feeding all your other cells and it gets consumed. It only becomes a problem if it accumulates and it stays there. Um, and so that 
from from my perspective, it's something that's manageable. Mm -hmm. And do you look at uh, uh, do you did you assess their insulin resistance uh, uh, by by the ratio of triglycerides to HDL? Uh, what we do is something called lipoprotein insulin resistance (LPIR). We certainly do triglyceride uh, to LDLC, but I find that LPIR is a more accurate measure. We also look at insulin level to um, to glucose, and we derive a HOMO IR. Um, but LPIR is much more accurate. And there's 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 a variety of ways to get to the same result, but I want to know what somebody's insulin resistance is. Um, we don't do craft testing on people. Craft testing is where you measure serial glucose levels against serial insulin levels over time. We don't have the capacity or time to do that. So that's why we do the LPIR and HOMO IR. Um, and it's a single stick rather than, you know, three hours of, of repetitive blood draws, although that would probably be more accurate. Um, but we still get sufficient information. Um, and also I'm early on, I'm trying to identify, you know, how much insulin are you actually producing? If, especially if you're morbidly obese and you're diabetic, um, how much insulin are you actually producing? So we measure C peptide. And that gives me a real good idea of what their underlying production is, especially if you're giving them exogenous insulin, if they're type two diabetic and you're giving them exogenous insulin, you don't know how much they're producing on their own. Um, and so you want to know what their C-peptide is underneath that. I've always wondered how they uh, measure insulin resistance in, uh, in a type one. LPIR is possible, I guess, but I think you're going to be, um, it depends on what your weight st stasis is. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's going to be a lot tougher to measure. But if if you maintain, if you do like a, a basically a clamp test and, and you're trying to maintain um, homeostasis, but it'd be way more complicated. Um, I, I think the, the, the general gist of it is... Um, is, you know, are you, as long as you're not going into diabetic ketoacidosis um, and you're decent weight, you're not mor morbidly obese and you're using the least amount of insulin as possible, um, that would make you relatively insulin sensitive. It's not going to give you a numeric number, but it's going to give you a relative feel of what, what that is. Now, you can probably get to a numeric number by other means. Yeah. And as long as your insulin uh, uh, sort of dose isn't or requirement isn't going up consistently. Isn't going up. And yeah. you also have to realize that the body, the pancreas is not the only place that, that makes insulin in the human body. You get peripheral insulin production as well. Um, and it's in other cells, but it's not the, it, it's a very small portion of it. Um, but there is some peripheral insulin production, but it's not in beta cell. But there are some other compounds that, that are insulinogenic um, that you get. So... But again, in a type 1 diabetic, it's it's much more complicated. And type 1 diabetics doing ketosis is much more challenging. Um, it definitely, you can quickly, um, they're, they're, much more, they're much more brittle. And you can get yourself into trouble um, if you're not well equipped to, to handle the type 1 diabetic. And I've seen some disasters happen where people do it on their own and they they're not sure exactly what they're doing and they end up on the wrong end of it because they, they don't understand that just because you're in ketosis doesn't mean you're healthy. If your ketones are 10, if you're a type one diabetic and I've never, you know, it, it, it's a little bit different. Dr. Pada, that was a fascinating conversation. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And I wish you a beautiful day um, in uh, uh, St. Louis, right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye for now. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.